Welcome to Hannah United Methodist Church's online worship for April 26, 2020. We have a few announcements for today. Remember that online giving is available through the website at hannahumc.org, or you can text it to 219-217-1046. Thank you so much for your ongoing faithfulness to the mission and ministry of Hannah United Methodist Church, but most of all, to being faithful to God knowing that even in these strange times, or especially in these strange times, the work of God's church continues. You will also notice uh, as you navigated to the uh, webpage to view this uh, worship video that there was a section to the right where I asked that you uh, enter your name and email address and how many people, including yourself, are watching this with you. By taking attendance in this way, that will help me to see how effective this method of reaching out to the congregation and our community is, and if there's any things that we need to adjust or change to uh, reach more people. Also in the past week, I sent out a survey by email. Uh, many of you have responded, not everyone has, asking you to uh, basically tell me which videos you have watched since we went online. Uh, again, that's to help me to bring the word of God to you and to our community. So remember to check the website often. It's the primary means that I have of conveying information and connection. And uh, anything that uh, comes up, that will be where it will be found first. Also, thank you for those who are using the prayer wall. I deeply uh, find that a very effective way to share prayer concerns. So any prayer concern that you put on the prayer wall won't be posted publicly for people to see until I have reviewed it, making sure that there's no uh, personal information that could uh, violate somebody's uh, privacy. But it does give us the opportunity to pray for each other and pray for those that we have concerns for, as well as to share our celebrations with one another. Let us open our worship with these words of encouragement. Sing praises to God, O you saints, and give thanks to God's holy name. We exalt you, O God, for you have restored us to life. We may cry through the night, but your joy comes in the morning. You hear us, O God, and you are gracious in our distress. You turn our mourning into dancing. Our souls cannot be silent, O God, our Savior, we give thanks to you forever. Let us pray. Loving Father, in these strange times of social distance, you are present with us, binding us together with cords that cannot be broken, even though we may try to untie them. May our time of worship tighten those cords and give us a sense of your presence with us and an assurance that our bonds with each other are as strong and imperishable as you are. Grant us new life in this day, new hope for tomorrow, a rock-solid faith to sustain us, and an ever-deeper love for you, for our neighbors, and even for our enemies. May fresh growth appear in our discipleship rising up out of the cracks of this broken world and our broken lives. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the events of our day and to follow your way in all that we do, that we may not only have hope for ourselves, but also bring hope to others as the light of Christ shines through our words and our actions in this world today and forevermore. Amen. And now let us join together and sing the hymn, Come, let us use the grace divine.
We have several prayer concerns this week. Let us remember in our prayers the family of George, who passed away from COVID-19. Robin's friends who have had COVID-19 in the family are doing better. Let us also remember the staff and inmates at Westville Correctional Center where there has been an outbreak. Also, Misty, who has cancer, and Greg, who had returned home from the hospital only to have to return shortly thereafter. Let us pray for these and all the other things that are upon our heart. Good, good God, we come to you today with concerns, with worries, with fears, with hesitant hope. Help us, Lord, to put our trust in you, to bring healing and wholeness, to bring hope and encouragement, to bring light into the darkness. But Lord, as we pray, we are reminded that you never fail to heal, that you never fail to give hope, that you never fail to be the light. Indeed, it is our faith that comes up short, not your goodness. So Lord, in our prayers, as we give all of these concerns to you, may you, if it be your will, give back to us an increase in faith, an increase in trust, and an increase in letting you be God. For we do not know your ways, O Lord. We sometimes don't get the answers that we hope for in our prayers. Let that not lead us to doubt. We sometimes don't understand the answers that you give us. Let us not lean onto our own understanding. And sometimes, when we are left to our own hearts and minds. We may begin to doubt. We may begin to feel like in some way you are punishing us. But Lord, help us to look in those times to the cross, to the empty cross, that proves to us that even when we fail you by nailing your son to the cross, you do not fail us. For you gave him life again, raising him up out of the tomb so that we would know that we too have life, that we could trust you, that we could grow in faith and live by your grace. Forgive us, Lord, for those times that we fall short of that. But we know, Lord, that even when we fall short, you never fail. You bring life, you bring hope, you bring wholeness, Help us, Lord, to know, even when we do not see, to trust, even when it seems impossible, and that when we get those answers that we do not understand, remind us that your wisdom is far greater than our own. And so today, Lord, we come before you in expectant hope, in longing for faith, and in seeking your love and your light. You, Lord, gave us your Son, Jesus Christ, even when we were yet sinners, and even as we are yet sinners, you still give your Spirit to us. You still bring your Son to us. For even though Jesus sits in heaven at the right hand, at your right, he also dwells in our hearts. Give us ears to hear his voice. Give us eyes to see his working in the world. And give us the faith, the faith to never, ever doubt that you are always, always the sovereign Lord. And that even when we do not know how things will turn out, we know that you are with us. So, Lord, we believe that you are with us and help us in our unbelief. So as we are gathering together our prayers and remembering all that Jesus has done for us, we lift up to you the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we hear the scripture read, listen for the word of God through the words of Peter from 1 Peter chapter 3, 17 to 23. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. And that word of God is for the people of God. Thanks. Be to God. Please pray with me. Guide us today, Lord. Speak to us and lead us to put our whole trust and faith in you. May we set our hope upon the blood of Christ and that alone. In his name we pray. Amen. When I was young, one Christmas, my dad gave me a rock tumbler. Maybe you know what these are. It's a little jar, and you put ugly, plain rocks in that jar, along with some water and some grit, close the jar up, and put it on a little motor that rolls it and rolls it and rolls it. And after, well, an incredibly long time, several days, if I remember right, you open it up, and those ugly rocks have turned into something beautiful. I used them to make a tie tack for my dad and a ring for my mom. Now, yeah, that was the gift of a child to his parents, so it's not like something you'd buy at the jewelry store. But those rocks that looked so plain to begin with, so ordinary, became something really special. God does the same thing with us through Jesus Christ. And a perfect example of this transformation of a rock is the Apostle Peter. Peter was not his name. His name was Simon. But Jesus gave him the nickname of Peter, or or actually in, in Greek, it was Petros. And Petros was the Greek word for a rock. So Jesus gave Peter the nickname of rock, the rock, rocky. And Jesus did this, as recorded in the 16th chapter of Matthew, when Jesus asked the apostles, who do the people say that I am? And then he asked the apostles, who do you say that I am? And Peter rises to the occasion and says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said, you are indeed my rock, and on you I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not have victory over the church. But yet, Peter, the rock, was a rock that could break, a rock that had rough edges, 
a rock that wasn't all that much. In fact, just a few short verses after Jesus praises Peter for recognizing that he, Jesus, was the Messiah, Jesus is having to chastise quite severely Peter because when Jesus started talking about what it meant to be this Messiah that Peter confessed Jesus to be and that this Messiah must go to Jerusalem and be crucified, Peter did not expect that that was what the Messiah would do. Peter expected the Messiah to conquer and put everything right. Surely the Messiah wouldn't go and die. And so Jesus chastises him, saying, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block or a rock to trip over. You do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. The rock, Peter, was a stumbling rock. Even later, on the night that Jesus was arrested, while the disciples gathered for the Last Supper, Jesus was talking to his disciples about how they will scatter, how one of them would betray him, that one being Judas. And Peter blurts out, I will never desert you. But Jesus says three times before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny that you ever knew. me." And indeed, that's what Peter did. This rock, this solid, hard rock that you should be able to depend on, broke. It broke when Peter failed to understand what Jesus' mission as Messiah was. And it broke when Peter failed to understand the events of that night that would lead to Jesus' crucifixion. That in fear and confusion, when his back was against the wall, Peter denied that he ever knew Jesus, just as Jesus had predicted. Yes, Peter, Simon, the rock, would be the rock upon which Jesus would found his church. But even rocks can break. Even rocks can get eroded and washed away. The mighty Grand Canyon was carved by water flowing through rock. Jesus knew all this about Peter, about you, and about me, that we are able to break, that we are imperfect. In fact, that is why Jesus came for us. I think it's an interesting coincidence that Jesus' profession, his job when he worked with his father Joseph, was what we always call a carpenter. But the actual Greek word that's used to say, that we translate carpenter, is tecton. And a tecton was actually, our word technician comes from it. A tecton in Israel was not so much a carpenter as more like a stonemason or a stone dresser. Because wood and trees were rather sparse in Israel. So common household items weren't made out of wood like they are for us but were actually stone, rock. So Joseph and Jesus most likely made tabletops out of rock, chairs out of stones. There was some woodwork involved, but the primary thing that a tecton would have had as their raw material was rock. I find it, let's say, ironic that the job that Jesus had before he began his mission was of taking stone and making it of use. Jesus took Peter the rock and made it of use, such that Peter could be the rock upon which the church was founded. Through Peter, we get to 
experience Peter's redemption. Because yes, Peter broke. He failed to recognize what it meant for Jesus to be the Messiah. He denied his Lord. But he also experienced the grace of Jesus Christ. He experienced the power of the blood of the Lamb to bring new life to him, new faith, new courage, new strength. Indeed, I believe, that it's because of Peter's experience of failure and grace that Peter was able to be the rock that the church would be built upon. That gave him the personal experience of Jesus' grace to be able to share it with others. Now, Peter continued to break. There's a story in the book of Acts where Peter went to visit Paul in Antioch, and Paul and Peter ate with the church in Antioch, which was made up of Jews and Gentiles. But it was unlawful for a Jew to have a meal with a Gentile. But Paul, so confident in the grace of Jesus Christ, and so certain that his mission for Jesus was to carry the message to Gentiles, Paul did not let the Jewish law prevent him from obeying Christ. And so, Peter joined him until some other Jewish Christians from Jerusalem arrived in Antioch. And then Peter, as a hypocrite, stopped eating with the Gentiles. He broke. He was a failure, and Paul called him out on it. And Peter, indeed, repented of that. When we break, when we fail, we can experience the grace of Jesus Christ. It's not our perfection that makes us of use to Christ. It's our experience of his grace that makes us of use to Christ in the church that makes us Christians. We indeed are saved by his blood. And when we value his blood above all else, we have a witness to share. Indeed, Peter talks in this passage from 1 Peter about that it's more precious than gold or silver. Now, gold and silver, sure, Peter was referring to the money that changed hands, but even more so, he was referring referring to those things that we value, those things that we think are precious. And Peter's experience of grace led him to know how much value the blood of the Lamb was. Because Peter was a rock that had been broken again and again, but he'd experienced the grace of Jesus Christ again and again. It wasn't that Peter was all that learned. It wasn't that Peter was such a kind and gentle man. If you read the Gospels, you know he wasn't. It was that Peter, in his broken rockiness, had experienced the grace of Jesus Christ and learned through that experience to put his trust and faith in Christ. We each break like Peter, and we each can experience the grace of Jesus Christ. And because we experience that grace, we know firsthand that that grace is available for all those other rocks out there with their jagged edges that crack and break and that crumble under the stress and pressure that they experience in this world, even if, maybe especially if, that stress and pressure is of their own doing because of their own sin. Jesus came to introduce us to God, his Father. Now, Peter thought he knew all about God. You and I may think we know all about God. But Jesus revealed God to us, a God that we thought we knew. But he revealed a side to God that we're hesitant to believe and we're hesitant to trust 
For if this grace thing is true, then what do we do about all of the brokenness in our own life and the world? Our impulse, because of the things that we value, the silver and gold of our own lives, is that we want to fix ourselves. We want to throw ourselves into that rock tumbler and become polished on our own merit. And we want other people to do the same thing too. But the truth is, if we try to be the grace for ourselves, we're going to wind up being crushed gravel, sand. There will be nothing left. It's only when in Jesus' hands, by the power of his blood, that we can become that beautiful, beautiful rock with so many colors and so many facets, but smooth. It is only by the blood of Christ that we can become the polished gemstone that God intends us to be. But no matter how much of a rock we are, and even when we become polished, we still fail. Jesus' grace overcomes it all. It's all about his grace. And because of his grace, we can put our faith in Christ. We can put our faith in God. Because even when we cannot respond perfectly, and we can't, it is about his grace. One of the things that is a danger for serious Christians who have deep faith, is that we can come to put our faith in our own faith rather than in the blood of Christ. It creeps in. It seeps in. This idea that God is pleased with us and so rewards us because of our faithfulness. God is pleased when we are faithful. But God loves us, even when we are broken. He loves us no more when we are polished. He loves us enough that the Lamb's blood was slain for us. The message that Peter has to give to us, the hard-fought, hard-won message from his experience of brokenness and grace, is to trust in the blood of the Lamb alone. There is nothing else that will save us. Our own faith does not save us. It is the grace of God. Our faith is important because it helps us to live by that grace, to live for that grace, and to give that grace to the world. But we are saved. We are made whole. We are polished. We are made beautiful by the blood of the slain. Faith in Jesus is important because without it, we will be weak, weak rocks, like chalk that you can break in your hands. But when we set our faith and hope in the blood of Christ, he can make us as strong as his very blood. And because of this, because of we are enabled to love. We can't love out of our own power. We don't generate this kind of love. It doesn't come from our will. We don't decide to love. The kind of love that Christ gives to us, he shares his love with us. He shares God the Father's love with us. And that is what makes us strong. And that is what makes us an unbreakable rock because it is the love of God and Jesus Christ, the love that gave its blood for us that makes us strong. We don't love our way into relationship with God. God loves his way into relationship with us. Our love is a response to God's love coming first. Our love comes from God when we set our faith and hope God and Jesus Christ and the blood of the Lamb. 
It is that love that enables us to love. It is that love that grows out of relationship with God. And that is the meaning of Easter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that we might have life. Life in God is love. It is strength. It is powerful. And it is more valuable than silver or gold. And it is a guide for us. Because when our love falls short, when we find ourselves having trouble loving our enemy, when we find ourselves having harsh words for those who live a different way than we do, for those who don't accept the grace of Jesus Christ, for those who reject him, when we have ill feelings for anybody, it's not because they are evil that we are not loving them. It's because we are not trusting in God's love and grace with our full hearts. And we're all there. We all have that happen. We're fragile and brittle and broken and sometimes hard-headed. I know I am. My rock can be really, really stubborn. And when I'm right, I know that I'm right. But when I know that I am right, I'm not leaving room in my heart for God's rightness, for God's love. So when I feel when you feel ill feelings, when you say bad things about people. Now, you can say bad things about what they do. You can say, that was not good. But the person themselves is a beloved child of God. And when we fail to love them, to be kind to them, to be encouraging to them, to wish good things and only good things for them, then it is because we are not putting our full faith in Christ. It's a measure, it's a gauge by which we can tell how strong is the rock that we are standing on. Are we standing on our own rock? Or are we standing on the solid ground of the Lamb and his blood? We can always be broken. And we can always be healed and made whole and made more perfect and more loved. The blood of the Lamb is always available for us. And when we value that more than anything else, we become filled with that kind of sacrificial love. And we can give thanks to our Lord because that love is imperishable. It does not die. It does not break. It does not change. There where we can set our faith and hope. Amen. For living the call this week, I want to remind you that this worship series that we're in, Revive Us Again. It's all about revival. New life, new energy, new vigor, new strength, increased faith and hope and trust and love. We need revival, day in and day out, some days more than others. But to be revived in this time is such a powerful witness to the world. So to live the call this week, identify those areas that break you, those areas that are still rough edges on the rock of your life, and lift them up to Jesus. Let them be bathed by the blood of his love so that they can become polished and smooth and beautiful. His sacrifice can wash us clean and lead us to love as he loved. When we stand firmly on Jesus as our foundation. So all of those areas that show that we still have rough edges, they are an opportunity to experience the life-changing grace that Peter experienced and that you and I have experienced again and again in our lives. Let us in this week be revived again. And to help us on our way, let us now sing the same hymn we sung for our revival last week, and we'll sing it again next week, 
Revive us again. Let us pray. God of the resurrection, you have clearly demonstrated your faithfulness and love to the world through sending your Son, Jesus Christ. Through a trust-filled relationship with Jesus Christ, we experience joy, peace, hope, and love. May we live as Easter people this week and every day to come for the rest of our lives until we come home to you. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. And let us now sing our closing hymn, Nothing But the Blood.
the world needs now, what I need now, and I imagine what you need now, is hope, is light, is life. But our hope and our light and our life is not found in the world restored to its old ways. It's not going to be because we get to open things back up and get to gather again, though we will enjoy all of that, and it will be so precious when we do. But our hope, our light, and our life is in a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ and standing firm on him as the solid rock. He indeed is the only hope, the only light, and the only life. And he gives himself freely to us and asks us only to receive him. But he also asks us to give him. So go into your world, amongst your family, into the online world. For those of us who are still working, you're working. And share from the experience of your brokenness the good news of Jesus Christ. And it is in his name, and in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, that we go and live this redeemed, polished, beautiful living stone.